Um, so welcome to Nothing Is Rocket Science season two. And uh, we have a rocket science in the house today. Welcome uh, to Kevin De Bruin. Hi, <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Yep, you're a friendly neighborhood rocket scientist here. So let's talk about <laughs> actual rocket science. <laughs> ah, friendly neighborhood. Um, so with power comes responsibility. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> so how have you been? Any any new interesting uh, space projects in the new year? New space projects. In the, I mean, NASA's got a ton of stuff coming up. Uh, me specifically, I'm working on some stuff with the Nuclear Weapons Center and the Space Force. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking into cross-industry collaboration. Uh, so that's going to be government. And if we're talking like, you know, Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, kind of an integration of everybody working together to, to create some uniform things. I'm speaking very broadly and generally because that's really I like all I can do. It's classified, um, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there's always fun and new and fun, exciting things happening in space. We have so many so many new projects and current projects that are going on, like the Voyager spacecraft that were launched in 1977, they're still working. We've got two active Mars rovers and a helicopter on Mars. We got new missions launching this year. We have Europa Clipper launching in October. We are 10 short months away from my baby, my favorite project, my first spacecraft ever, uh, launching out to the Jovian moon Europa to hopefully mm -hmm. We won't find aliens with this moon, but we could potentially confirm the habitability for life forms to exist. Mm. So we'll see. That's yeah, that's a lot of spoilers for today's podcast, I guess. Um, but it's a great way to start. Uh, but first things first. Um, the last time we spoke, I remember you told me that the word rocket science is not a thing. So uh, risking my brand name, uh, I yeah. urge you to still el elaborate on that. Yeah. So nothing is rocket science. It's true. There is nothing that is rocket science. So what we do, what we refer to a rocket science is actually rocket engineering. So science mm -hmm. is observing natural phenomena, things that already exist and deciphering or uncovering the knowledge that is already present somewhere um, where engineering is creating something new. You're engineering a new thing that's invention. So when we're talking about rockets, rockets were new. There isn't a natural phenomena that is a rocket that matches the same physics. So we've created rockets. So it is rocket engineering, but the mm -hmm. phrase rocket science just took a hold of, you know, back in the day. And that's, that's what we use. Um, NASA does explicitly state they have a podcast and on it they say, yeah, there is no such thing as rocket science. It's actually rocket engineering because we're creating new things, but everyone knows it is rocket science and it's a, it's there's less syllables in science than engineering, so it rolls off the tongue easier. It's it's like every other word when it just becomes common parlance, you just go with it instead of uh but uh I guess, you know, it's it still stays with the theme of uh, the theme and the mission of this podcast, like debunking myths. So I guess it is still a good, a solid start to season two for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know where to start, given how how um, multifaceted you are. But I guess we'll start with two of your favorite things: rockets and space. Yes. Um, so yeah, Kevin. So tell me, uh, how did a kid kid from Wisconsin go for, uh, go to become a rocket scientist at NASA? Well, what was the journey like? Yeah, long journey. All yeah. the flashbacks are happening right now. <laughs> so we have all yeah, the time in the world. all the time in the world. Careful, yeah. I might just open up my book and start reading it to you. <laughs> 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 so I've documented my journey in a, a memoir called To NASA and Beyond, and it all started with me watching the movie October Sky when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. when I was about ten years old. And for those listening or watching that haven't heard of October Sky, it's based on a true story about a young boy in Colwood, West Virginia, Homer Hickam Jr., who sees Sputnik, our first artificial satellite from the Soviet Union, go across the night sky. And he gets inspired by this, starts building rockets, wins a science fair, goes on to become a NASA engineer training astronauts. And when I saw this movie, I was like, that's so cool. Like, I, I want to work for NASA. I want to design spaceships for NASA one day. So I got to fast forward going on to college. 
I decided to get a uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering and started to apply for NASA intra internships. Um, eventually got one. Um, I was working at NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia. And while I was there, I realized that if I truly wanted a full-time job at NASA, I was going to need an advanced degree. I needed more specific aerospace experience and education. So I decided to go on to grad school and I got a master's in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. And that is where I really started to learn about actual rocket science, spacecraft engineering, and the science um, that is throughout the, the universe and the cosmos. And after, while I was there, I was working with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory through graduate research projects. And then mm -hmm. I decided that JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, was the only place I wanted to go for NASA because it does all the robotic solar system exploration. So all of the robots that are out past the moon from NASA have come from this facility. Um, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. We're sending robots like human space exploration is kind of cool, but I'm like, I want to work on robots. So I applied mm -hmm. to, to NASA JPL initially didn't get a job, but I was able to graduate and get a 10 week internship with them through the research I was doing. And while I was there, I proved to them that I belonged and then got hired on as a full-time engineer at the end of those 10 weeks. So that's the, mm -hmm. the abridged version of it. So basically seeing October sky as a little boy and just working my butt off in school, knowing that that's what I wanted to do and figure out what are the different routes I can get into NASA and keep on walking those paths and creating new paths when they ended to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my official uh... title, my official title at NASA was a uh, systems engineer. So I was a flight systems engineer specifically. So what what, what was the uh, what were the kind of projects that you were working on uh, as a systems engineer there at NASA? Yeah, the first one was uh, Europa Clipper. Uh, so we'll probably we'll be diving mm -hmm. into that one a little bit more here. Yeah, so Europa, because I was working on that at Georgia Tech. Um, so when I got into NASA, that was my first project that I was working with. And then mm -hmm. I joined a team called Team X. So Team X, X doesn't really stand for anything, but they're a concurrent engineering team. So what concurrent means is like it's all done at the same time, kind of like things in mm -hmm. parallel rather than things in series. So in series, things are done like A, B, C. Like I do something, I send it to you to do something, and then you send it to somebody else, and then maybe eventually it comes back to me. And we're just sending things around, and the process takes a long time. Well, concurrent engineering is we have all the people in the same room, all on computers with their expert models, and they're all linked up in an intranet system. So we can mm -hmm. do a real-time exploration and design with everyone there, just three hours, sit down, send data back and forth, and do it concurrently. So I was doing, over the course of three years, I did over 30 different missions in that environment. So we're designing things like, uh, Mars sample return, which hasn't been fully designed and built yet. Uh, we took a look at some of those. We were doing telescopes. There's one called HabX, which is supposed to launch or be built and designed after the James Webb Space Telescope. We were looking mm -hmm. into that. Moon sample returns. Titan, the moon of Saturn, which my dog is named after, has liquid mm -hmm. methane, ethane lakes. So we looked into submarines and boats that would explore those, those lakes and even go underwater. Uh, what else do we do? And then CubeSats. Um, so CubeSats are smaller spacecrafts. Uh, they're more built like with off the shelf components. Um, so it's a smaller, easier way to do a lot of colleges now getting into the CubeSat environment. And a lot of those are earth orbiting. And we even did some that were looking to go to the moon and to Mars. So basically everything from earth observations, earth orbits, going to the moon, going to the outer solar system and then telescopes to look beyond our solar system into other galaxies back to the the start of time as we know it uh with the big bang i dabbled in a little bit of everything um, which was really mm -hmm. really exciting and i got a wide wide variety of of different types of space missions that i was always like drinking from a fire hose learning new things because i need to learn mm -hmm. everything that i can about like yeah. this area this mission the science and then help bring a mission and put it all together wow that's that's interesting yeah. and especially uh you know when, when you're new into something like it's it's great to be thrown into deep end 
and uh, and you know learning from uh, learning from different projects. I'm sure, uh, like you know, it it'll be easy for you to figure out what is something that you're more interested in, and uh, you know, pursue that probably pursue that area of interest. Yes, that's that that's amazing. And um, you know, I do have some questions about uh, yeah the Europa, and uh, you know, I'm sure our viewers are going to enjoy listening to that. Um, but you know, to, before we he heading uh, head into that segment, um, you know, I I listened to your TED talk uh, without space we would die, and I found that interesting. Like uh, I found I probably found an answer to the question that I had for a long time. Um, you you talk about uh, you know things that came into existence thanks to space research, like you talk about uh, the image sensor uh, technology LEDs. Um, and then several other broad and uh, air safety technologies that came into existence. Uh, can you can you tell us about why space <clears throat> space research is important? Uh, you know, for all walks of life. Yeah, space research is incredibly important for everybody. There is the question that gets asked a lot by people of like, why are we spending money on space exploration right. and stuff when we have people who are homeless, people who are dying, people who are starving, right. and there isn't a straightforward answer to that, but what I like to say is that it's not choosing one thing or the other. It's how do we do everything that is, you know, we're looking out for pushing the boundaries of technology and society forward, but also taking care of those less fortunate. And why are we pulling from space? Like, why is the question of pull from space to take these? Like, there's a lot of other things going on, like the salaries of congressmen, you know, I'm just throwing like one thing out there or military budget and stuff like that. So the importance of all of it is it affects all of us every single day, almost constantly, whether we know it or not. Some of the things I highlighted in the TED Talk, which is what you've, you've mentioned, is like, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to segue just a little bit and just be like, I, I've always yeah. wanted to have a person try and do a day without using any sort of space technology or space derivative, like derivative technology. So if you were to wake up in the morning, right, what can you not use? Maybe you won't be able to, to sleep. Maybe you're on a memory foam mattress, right? That came from mm -hmm. space technology, right? Mm -hmm. Or some of like the, the insulating blankets or technology through that you wouldn't be able to have. Or let's say you're going to go into work. So you get in your car. Well, the roads, the tires, this stuff comes from space technology. So the grooves in the road come from testing uh aircrafts landing on wet runways back in the 60s mm -hmm. or maybe it was even before that and nasa put grooves in the roadways and it helped improve the traction of the airplanes landing on wet runways the department of transportation took that put it in the freeways and the freeway accidents were reduced by 85 percent right mm -hmm. so we have the the roads themselves the tires improving space shuttle landing tires then got pushed over into everyday car tires before that if you got dressed in the morning and you put on shoes a lot of running shoes have technology that was derived from space applications in them. So if you're wearing tennis shoes or you go for a run in the morning, you work out, great, you're going to work. You put uh, the GPS in your phone, right? Mm -hmm. You're using that satellite constellation to teach you where to go or to show you where to go. And using your phone, like we talked about, you know, the image sensors in your phone mm -hmm. come from space technology. Or how about how phones communicate in the first place? You know, communication, yeah. sending signals around, not necessarily just satellites, but how the phone operates on a base level, as well as let's say you need to pick up some gas on your way to work and you use a credit card. Most credit card systems now are reliant on satellite transfers rather than like hardwire transfers. So you might not be able to buy gas if the satellite link is down and all you have is a credit card. So like all of these things that actually make our wow. everyday life possible are think we have to thank space for that stuff. Right. And that's just like us living every day. You know, there's more severe applications or more, I don't know if severe is the right word, but the ones that actually like do save lives. So when I say the title of the talk was without space, we die. Some people are like, yeah, you know, my, my daily life, if I didn't have this, I would die without this. I would die without that. But there are people who would actually die without space-based technology. So the 
the dampening systems from the vibrations during space shuttle launches were then moved into shockwave, no, eh, shockwave, earthquake shock absorbers in LA and Tokyo. They put these in the foundations mm -hmm. of buildings and they're able to absorb the shock waves from an earthquake so that the buildings don't actually collapse so they can okay. wait, withstand the, the earthquake. So all those people who would have potentially become fatalities during an earthquake because their building collapsed, didn't collapse with that technology. Or you mentioned LED lights. So there's a man by the name of George Grace who lives in Buffalo, New York, who was diagnosed with cancer. And he is cancer free today because of PDT, photodynamic therapy. And that came mm -hmm. from the technology using LEDs to grow plants on the International Space Station. You ingest a cancer medication and then they use LED lights to activate that cancer medication within your body. That came from space technology. So he is still alive and well today. I talked to him a few years ago because I highlighted him in the TED talk. I'm like, I want to follow up mm -hmm. with you, see how things are going yeah. to things like, you know, um, medical, medical devices, healthcare so many, devices, so many yeah. things. healthcare, like the, the list goes on and on. I, I forget a lot of the things like I can be using a space based derived technology and not even know about it. Like firefighter gear is another thing, you know, that comes from space technology as well. So people out there saving lives are using devices that were initially meant for space that have then have had a, a creative spin-off technology to bring it down here to the consumer or to the heroes down on earth that are saving lives when people are in trouble. So it's it's all over. This one, if you can't tell, it gets me worked up just a little bit because there is just so much information out there that people right. don't know about. It's like, do you know how much space is in your life? Like mm -hmm. if we stopped spending money on space or we never invested in space in the first place, we wouldn't have all of these things. And then you think about that towards the future, right? So let's say we cut all space funding right now mm -hmm. and we said, okay, we're putting that towards anything else, right? We've only been in space for what are we at, 70 years now? So like mm -hmm. the, the moon landing was 1969. So that's about 55 years ago, right? And the first human went in space earlier than that in the 60s. So our space program, like NASA was started when Sputnik happened. So we're looking back to, let's say about the 19, mid 1950s. And all of this technology that has come in the last 60 years it like Moore's law is that, you know, it doubles every two years. If we were to stop doing advancements in one area of the tech sector, mm -hmm. what are things that we are normally going to have in 20 years that wouldn't exist? So like back when, you know, we weren't alive yet and our, our parents were the, the ones as children, like things they thought mm -hmm. impossible, carrying around a device that connects you to everybody yeah. in the world has more processing power than the computers on the lunar landers in the Apollo era. like. There are things that we cannot fathom yet or that ideas are not out there, like the secrets that still need to be unlocked that in 20, 30, 40 years will literally revolutionize how we live our lives, just like this thing has. And yeah, it wouldn't yeah. have come about, or I can't say it wouldn't have come about. It would not have come about in this way or in this time. Maybe if we didn't have a space program, the iPhone and everything along with it, the smart devices could have come out in you know a few hundred years. But we have that space technology to pull us forward into the future. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I guess like the the rapid the rapid growth that we've seen, especially in the last twenty years. Like I, I mean, I, we didn't use cell phones growing up, and like I, I can't imagine my life without my phone right now. So the rapid change in our uh, lifestyle because of these devices, uh, I guess, is thanks to space. Um, yeah, and like that is a way that you can cripple a country um sure. or or like a, a nation or a continent is like in warfare all right so now we're talking a little bit about what i i mentioned in the beginning of like some of my projects mm -hmm. now is that you can take out our satellites and that will cripple the united states or you take out right. you know uh, european satellites or china satellites right and they you won't be able to have everyday life continue on right so that's mm -hmm. why there is a lot of emphasis in being able to protect how we have our current 
way of life. And that is because of space, space technology. Yeah. Um, you you uh, you also mentioned in your um, video about the the numbers, like the it, it said that in in 1976, for every every dollar spent, uh, 14 dollars was returned to the economy. Um, I was just curious, how did they arrive with this? Like, how does it translate to numbers? Yeah, I don't know the specific um, okay e equation or or how exactly mm -hmm. that number. There, there's a paper that that number came from, and they. Okay. They, they derive okay. it all out. And on a top level, you would look mm -hmm. at how much money was spent on said program or what was NASA's budget for that year or a mm -hmm. running average over 10 years. And then we do have a list of like all of the jobs. So how much money was put into employees' pockets, right? And then how much of that are they spending? You can look at that with tax returns and how much spin-off technology or those space derived technologies that we talked about like putting the grooves in roads or mm -hmm. uh you know the, the image sensors and iphones how many of those technologies yeah. were developed released what are the sales that come from that that's right. a very top level general um, right right thing that was was done for that and if we're looking back in 1970 and it's one to 14 back then think about it now yeah. with how much yeah. more technology is in there right so the more money we spend on space this is very rough the more money we will eventually put back into the economy and drive more u.s consumerism yeah mm. which is people like to it's harder to fathom because people like to think more in the immediate returns what is my return on investment my roi of yeah. this so I pay taxes, right? I can see those like possibly going into roads or schools, but I put in taxes to the space program. What am I getting out of this? Cool, pretty pictures. You know, like that's the, the thing we can immediate return. Right. And that's <laughs> that's a very short-sighted mindset, but we are in, I would say the generation now of instant gratification. Instant gratification, like, I need, right. I need it now. But if we're trying to look for future generations or to actually like progress forward, if progress literally progress not like standstill we need to look at those like longer term investments and space is one of those um, we do learn amazing things kind of like immediately but if we're looking for what is the individual person impact of spending money on space it does take longer to then come back down to the consumer to the everybody mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's that's very interesting. Um, like, and especially in terms of numbers, when you put it to numbers, I think that's when, um, you know, people who are not in this area of work understand how it translates. And uh, that was that was why I I, um, I just wanted to give that analogy as to, oh, okay, so this is the return of investment, of course, in the in the long term. Yeah, um, and you're, you're talking about numbers. So yeah. I'll, I'll throw a few numbers out there. So back in the Apollo era, we were mm -hmm. spending a bunch of money but that was that was five percent of the government budget is what nasa got five percent okay. of the whole government budget so now when people hear like what is nasa getting per year they're hearing like 22 billion dollars they're like oh my gosh that is so much why are we spending all that money that 22 billion dollars is less than 0.5 percent of the entire mm -hmm. government budget so we went from five percent during the apollo era to 0.5 percent of a government mm -hmm. budget now so i like to use the percentages rather than saying yes nasa has a 22 billion dollar budget they get point like 0.49 percent of their government budget right now and that's mm -hmm. not only to just do space exploration nasa does like yesterday they just released their their new plane like their new concord the supersonic jet so we do aviation we do earth-based studies there's stuff that's Literally, like like just on Earth, um, we don't even have to go to space. We study Earth from from ships. We study Earth from land. We study Earth right. from airplanes, and that is also from NASA. So it's not just going to the moon. We are doing literally everything. So NASA's gotten so much bigger, has so many more missions and projects and tasks, and the amount of money from the government budget is less than what. 90 percent of what it was or 80 percent of what it was right so right. by putting it in, in those uh respective terms like you're saying with the numbers i think that that's a 
that's another like antidote I just wanted to put in there because twenty-two billion dollars is a lot of money. Or like the James Webb Space Telescope ended up being over ten billion dollars. I do have right. a problem with that. <laughs> that one it, it was forecasted to be less than the Hubble Space Telescope, which in the first place is laughable. Never should have happened. But if you look at the ten billion dollars and it was spread out over decades, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. It's not like we spent this all once. It's like it went to this like you know thousands of people over x number of years you know employ people did this this and that yes it should have yeah. been less but when we think about that like the mars rover let's say that's around i think it's two and a half three billion dollars that isn't just a one-time thing we're not spending that every year like the mars rovers took like like the latest one took what like 10 12 years to design build and, and send out there so then you're spending that three billion over the course of let's say nine years so that's what 500 million a year okay well that's not too crazy yes it's still a huge mm -hmm. number but putting it in right. those respective terms yeah that's a a great way to like have this conversation with people right i mean uh when you just give out the whole number <clears throat> definitely um the billion sounds good but adjusting for inflation and when you said it went down from five percent to point four or point five percent um i guess uh, I agree that there are other areas of research that needs to be funded with time, but um, but given given the uh, return of investment, I guess uh, I'm convinced that this is um, a, a good shot for research funding. Yeah, um, and I will I'll just do one little dig at the government here in the military. Yeah. We're like, okay, we don't <laughs> we we don't spend you know like ten thousand dollars on a hammer. Um, <laughs> Like we don't inflate our prices. So like the government has so much or the military as well has like so much money that cannot account for. That's just like gone. Like, oh, yeah, we lost like a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars would fund NASA for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. our, our entire lifetimes and more where like the military has just misplaced this money. And yeah, I could get out of the soapbox there. Okay. Um, so maybe when people ask the question, why do we spend all this money on space exploration when we should be doing this? We should just be like, well, the U.S. military misplaced $1.3 trillion last year. Um, maybe we should find that. And just, just push them off of space, put them onto something else. Well, um, this, uh, I guess you're giving us more than science. A lot of things to think about. Um, uh, no, no, this is just like... Uh, I, I like the paddles that, that we're thinking in. And uh, I guess this is how you would probably defend your uh, stand, I guess, right? Like if, if somebody else asks this question in press, I guess uh, it's a great way to defend your stand. Yeah, um, and like science, science isn't siloed. It would be great if science was siloed. It's all altruistic, yeah. like doing it for pure science, but no, no scientific mission has ever been altruistic. There is mm -hmm. politics that come into play. You need to understand right. the finances, the management, the politics, the international politics, not just, you know, internal to the United States, but how does it work with the rest of the world? All right. in how these missions come to be and what we spend our money on and what technologies get developed and then derived. It's it's a whole complicated engine. Yeah. Red, red tapeism to add to it. Um, <laughs> yep, <laughs> we'll throw that in the mix too. Um, that that actually um, reminds me of this. So uh, I work with a, a research scientist and uh, he's been in this field for like 40 plus years now. Um, and, you know, as, as fresh researchers in the lab, um, the first question he asked is, why do you think we do research? Uh, everyone is like, yeah, we want to help people. And, and I, I work in healthcare, so I'm like, the end of the day we want to find solutions for these uh, issues and they were very similar uh, you know answers from others and mm -hmm. then um, the first thing he said was uh, no we here for science like our job as scientists is to write papers to figure out what is what is there what isn't and uh, and and publish um, and in the course if you if we end up helping the humanity that is uh, you know, it's it's. I would consider it a win-win. Um, I mean, I I know he didn't mean it quite literally, but uh, I guess it's a great way to stay detached. Um, yeah, that's be like 
not too attached to what you're doing because sometimes you know negative results are also equally important uh, like finding the absence or the absence of uh, a relationship between two things is also equally important uh, you know when compared to uh, the positive results and uh, the more I'm, i'm getting into research i'm i'm learning the other nuances that you know as students as uh, as scientists when you when you see them growing up you're so attached to the results you're so attached to helping but yeah that's there that's that's if it happens in the course of your work it's great but our job is actually uh figuring out and like to see if this works or not and that's exactly what what you're trying to say and i was like i was trying to draw battles between these two but yeah you're completely right about that yeah thank you <laughs> i'm i'm glad that we're, <laughs> we're seeing parallels here and then also like we're talking about missions that have happened or that are like mm-hmm. planning to happen there are so many missions that don't happen that we put in months right. or years of effort and then the the top level committee or like NASA headquarters or funding and it's like no we're not going to do this mission so we have proposals so we'll like we'll submit 10 proposals 10 different teams of people who were their whole life for a few months or a year is to work on this mission proposal and try and make it happen and then it just doesn't happen and we getting attached to makes it difficult right because it's like oh i really yeah. wanted my mission to happen but yeah. the overwhelming scientific community believes that this mission should happen instead of my mission so it's like okay great yeah. we are getting some new science but it's just it's not my science it's right. this science so you have to just like all right great i'm not upset yeah. it's like we're still doing science yeah. it's just not the one that i put my effort into most recently so then you got to shift yeah. gears right yeah. i think like it, it's it's like choosing the greater good um yeah. <laughs> yep. well um so space talk is you know incomplete without mentioning little green men so i you know <laughs> i want to now venture into uh europa and stuff um Aliens. as somebody who is a newbie in uh, science research um not not very familiar with the uh, with with all the details uh i'm familiar with you know all the all the missions about mars and finding life on mars but um you told me last time about europa and jupiter's moon and that i started reading about it and i was like oh there's carbon dioxide was found in it in the in the frozen icy oceans of um uh, was it by the james webb telescope it could have been james webb could have been hubble you there's been a few different sources um that have confirmed it yeah yeah so can you can you tell us about it like what was these findings and um and um i would say the most pressing question was how is moon a better surface for supporting light a uh, life form than than a planet yeah is it um well so it's not necessarily that a moon is better than a planet it's that in this mm-hmm. instance this moon mm-hmm. has the ingredients for life as we know it where jupiter does not have the ingredients for life as we know it right. so the ingredients for life that we're aware of carbon based life forms carbon. is you need water you need composition so like the right elements like we're talking carbon dioxide and other things mm-hmm. and energy so for water where we find water on earth we most likely find life like you go and take a spoonful of water from a river a stream an ocean there's hundreds or millions or billions of tiny microorganisms in that water so europa has a saltwater ocean locked underneath an icy crust so it's got icy crust so we got ice and then we got saltwater mm-hmm. ocean so we got water that's out there that's the first thing we look for when looking for life yeah. like there is water everywhere um there's water on the moon there's water on the the back side of mercury there's water in the jupiter atmosphere the saturnian atmosphere like water is really everywhere whether it's it's vapor it's ice crystals it's molecular you know h2o so europa has that The other thing we need is the composition. So I said we were carbon-based life forms. We're looking for what we call biosignatures of life, the building blocks. So that is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and sulfur. C H N O P S. I call it schnapps. That's how I remember all of those. So we're looking for those elements in the right combination of molecules like carbon dioxide, you know, or H2O to be the the signs of life the biosignatures of life so we're identifying those at europa now enceladus 
a moon of Saturn, we just confirmed that it has all of those ingredients, the CH and OPS. So mm -hmm. it has every, every single one of those. So it is also a very exciting place to look for aliens. It's further away since it's at Saturn instead of Jupiter. It is mm -hmm. smaller than Europa. Enceladus is smaller than Europa and it's younger. It's only been around for, I think, about 500 million years where Europa has been around for like 4 billion years. So when you're thinking right. about terms of equilibrium, stasis, time for a habitable environment to exist and then for life to evolve through it, the longer something's been around, the more chance there is for that evolution to have happened. So that's why mm -hmm. we kind of, I personally am leaning more towards Europa than Enceladus, but looking for those those elements. So we've been able to detect a lot of them with the James Webb Space Telescope, which we launched you know, recently. We got the Hubble Space Telescope that's been around for a few decades that has also given us a lot of data. Then we had the Galileo uh, mission that was launched in 1989 that went to Jupiter. And we learned a lot from that mission flying by Europa. And then also Voyager, Voyager 1 and 2 both went by Jupiter. I don't know if both of them were able to check out Europa based on the trajectories or just one of them. But so that was back. They launched in 1977. So we've been learning all of these incremental things over the years as we've gotten more missions, more technologies to detect these different sorts of elements. The other thing you got to think about with detection is we tune or design our science instruments to detect certain things. And I believe it was on the Cassini spacecraft that their CDA, their cosmic dust analyzer, wasn't calibrated or designed to detect the heavier elements like phosphorus. Like it mm -hmm. wasn't like it, it, if it took it in, it wasn't within its spectral range to identify that one. So it's like we got to make design decisions as we're talking about lower weights and lower costs, lower power consumption in all these instruments and spacecrafts. So it's like, what is the, the highest priority? So I think it was James Webb that just found that phosphorus on Enceladus. Um, not 100% sure on that, but I think so. Mm -hmm. And the third one, so we have water, we have the composition, and then energy. So we need a way to power life. Here on Earth, we have the sun for photosynthesis, and then animals eat the plants, we eat animals, or we eat the plants, and kind of the sun is our driving force here on the surface mm -hmm. of Earth. But then if you go down to the ocean floor, there's life that doesn't experience sunlight, right? Where yeah. sunlight only penetrates about 200 meters of seawater. So we, ha we have life on the ocean floor. We've got snails, things that have never seen the light of day. Ghost fish that we find in the Challenger Deep of the Mariana Trench. That's like 12 kilometers deep down there. How do they survive? Well, we believe, well, I, we don't believe, we know that they survive via chemosynthesis. So chemical synthesis. So we've got like, you know, the geothermal energy that's within right. the earth. So we have things called black chimneys or hydrothermal vents that are releasing the energies, the salts, the minerals to feed life down there. So they run their metabolism off of chemosynthesis. So that's what mm -hmm. we think may be going on out at Europa or at Enceladus on the ocean floor could be these hydrothermal vents because the sunlight isn't strong enough to power photosynthesis as we know it that far out. We struggle with solar panels that far out. They're huge on uh, Europa Clipper, which is gonna be launching uh, this October. And then Juno is a mission around Jupiter. It looks like a fidget spinner. It's got three solar panel wings. And those are the mm -hmm. largest solar panels that we've deployed uh, to date because it's so far out. We need to collect all that sunlight. And then we're also talking about Life is not on the surface of Europa. It is either like in the ice or at the ocean ice interface or on the ocean floor, the rock water interface there. So even if the sunlight was strong enough out there, sunlight only penetrates 200 meters of seawater on Earth and we're only 93 million miles away. What about 500 million miles away? You're not going to be able to penetrate that ice to get down to the ocean. Right. So I know this is a lot of information, right? So no. there's... Four large moons at Jupiter called the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And they're all in a resonance around Jupiter, which means like their orbits are ratioed, basically. So we say every time that Io goes around once, Europa goes around a half a time. 
um, I needed to invert my numbers there. Uh, those aren't the exact ratios, but it's like, okay, every time IO goes around four times, Ganymede goes around once, something like that. So the gravities are pushing and pulling on each other. There's a gravitational dynamic with those moons and that causes right. them to push and pull. So to stretch and compact. So if this was yeah. Europa, right, the other moons are causing it to get a little bit big, get a little bit small. So you get that movement, that mechanical energy that turns to friction, which is what we think is fueling those hydrothermal vents on the, the sea floor, if they exist. So that's why we think Europa and Enceladus, and I'll even throw, you know, the moon Titan um, as well, mm -hmm. are better places because they have those environments. So it's not necessarily that mm -hmm. a, a moon is better than a planet. Like Jupiter is a gas giant, Saturn's a gas giant, okay. Uranus and Neptune are both icy gas giants. And mm -hmm. from life that we know it, from the conditions we're looking for, we're basically looking to match primordial Earth conditions. So like when life arose on right. earth as we believe it where is that out in the solar system and you know there, there could be life in jupiter we just we don't know don't we don't know where life is there could be life in the cloud tops of venus that's been uh something that's been hypothesized because venus mm -hmm. actually has an atmosphere you know mercury doesn't mars is like really tiny really thin basically non-existent kind of like the moon uh, much thicker than the moon but basically being stripped away over, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of years. And we're looking for, for life as we know it. And I, I'm laughing a little bit here and kind of holding up because even the definition of life as we know it is complicated, right? right. So if, like you go back to, to science class in elementary school. I, I was just making videos for, for this with a, an education company last year. The verdict is still out on whether like a virus is alive or dead. We don't know if it's a living thing or if it's a non-living thing. There isn't a consensus on what that is. So if we find mm -hmm. a virus on Europa, is is that is that life? Mm -hmm. Some would say yes, some would say no. So the definition of life itself is something that is still to be argued. So let's say mm -hmm. we get out there, we find organics and the things that we believe to, to be life. There's then going to be... I would say almost years of scientific debate of is that actual life unless we find a fish or a shark or Bigfoot mm -hmm. out on Titan, you know, unless we're capturing something that we can truly identify as life in, you know, video form. It's difficult to define what that life is. So unless we can find life like mm -hmm. us, then it's going to be much harder. And so carbon-based life forms. I'm going somewhere with this. Um, underneath carbon on the periodic table is silicone. So a lot of the movies that we see, aliens are made of plastic or they're like silicone-based life forms. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of rooted in a little bit of science. So that's an even heavier element, right? So if we're looking for microbacteria, but it's silicone-based instead of carbon-based, we're not going to be able to detect that with the instruments that we're designing for since it's life that we know. So then you take that exactly. next step of like life yeah. that we don't know. We don't, we're not currently trying to find life that we don't know, that we're right. not familiar with. We're trying to find yeah. our life. So based upon what we're seeing out in the solar system, what are the best places to go and look for that life as we know it? And that's the moon Europa, the moon Enceladus, Titan around Saturn, cloud tops of Venus is still like questionable. And then some people are still saying like underground at Mars. And we haven't found life yet on Mars. The Viking landers back in the 70s, was it? I might be wrong on that. I don't know if it was the 70s or 80s. They had life detection experiments. And one of them hit positive, but then they couldn't repeat that finding. So the PI, mm -hmm. the principal investigator of that experiment, firmly believes that he found life on Mars but no one else does because you couldn't replicate the experiment. Replicate it. Yeah. So like it was like a false positive and then two negatives or like, what was it like? So there's still a community out there that believes that there might be microbial life, you know, underneath the surface of Mars. Cause we have found that Mars was like earth 4 billion years ago. Right. It was, yeah. used to have, you know, water and, and rivers and valleys and stuff like that. So yeah. <laughs> I 
No, I'm, I'm glad you went on. No, I'm glad you went on the tang tangent because um, I was thinking on the same lines as um, you know. Even if life forms uh, exist or start to exist, will they undergo the same uh, kind of evolution that we did? Like, are we going? Is it going to be a replication of like? Is it going to be Earth too, or is it going to be something else that uh, we just uh, we just don't know? And yes. uh, I guess you've already answered that question. Yeah. Well, I. I've heard some people say that the scariest thing for us to ever find would be humans somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. If you go, let's say to, to Mars, you go underground and you find humans living underground, that's gonna be more freaky than if you find an alien out there. Cause you're like, wait, hold on. Like you're not <laughs> expecting to see another human. I mean, you're not expecting right. to see an alien, but the evolutionary process being the exact same. Mm. Mm, okay. Yeah. Weird. Like, what are the odds? Yeah, what are the right. odds? Uh, one in 400 trillion is the odds for us to have existed for life in the first place. To be a human on Earth is like one in 400 trillion. So mathematically, for life to exist, the mathematical probability is zero. So to replicate life, the mathematical probability, again, is zero. So that's where the questions of like, are we alone in the universe or are we not alone in the universe? It's a yes mm -hmm. or no question. Mathematically, it's the probability is zero. But then the other mathematical probability you look at is we are one planet in one solar system in one galaxy yeah. of billions of galaxies. If trillions right. of stars, that probability would then show that, oh, there's probably another planet with life out there. But that's on a grander scale. That's like, you know, general relativity mm -hmm. scale. Let's go down to the quantum mechanics of the how did life exist in the first place and then evolve into humans. That's the one in 400 trillion. Then if you take that zero probability combined with a potential lower probability of like the general relativity sense of how many habitable planets are out there in star systems. And then you have to multiply those probabilities together, which makes the zero even smaller. Yeah. So it's like if you put pure mathematics in it, it's zero. The possibility mm -hmm. of just life to exist in the first place and then be somewhere else. But... Mm -hmm. We're humans. We have an innate desire to want more than that. We have hope. We have belief. So it's like there could be more because we've seen that physics, geology, and chemistry work throughout the universe. But we haven't yet seen biology anywhere else than Earth. Is mm. biology uniform, universal? Like we okay. want it to be like that would be cool to know we're not alone. Like also scary, but like the wonders, like why did people cross the ocean why did explorers exist in the first place it's like we want to venture mm -hmm. we want to learn more we want to discover and if we are the only things here that's lame right <laughs> so yeah. yeah i mean i don't okay. say that i believe in aliens i do believe that there is microbial life and it's in our solar system somewhere um right i i think we will find that here we're getting into like my beware of aliens and like area 51 i do not believe whatsoever that we've had any contact with aliens to date mm. or it, like in the past or there's advanced civilizations that built the pyramids or anything like that i have zero confidence whatsoever um you know with that like quote carl sagan and say you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and right. if all we got are like shaky photos and videos of ufos and a few people here and there that said that they've experienced it and then yeah i don't know <laughs> if we can't show that like big bigfoot and unicorns and the loch ness monster exist you know like ufos they're all just they're there and ufo Far doesn't off. mean aliens and now it's uap instead of unidentified flying object we have unknown aerial phenomena which could be just ice crystals reflecting in the sky Right. That's a big thing that people say is UFOs means aliens, and it just it doesn't. Now I'm now I'm getting into the to you, that. You so I want to hold up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went from talking about the possibility of someone existing, and to be like, no, I don't think they exist. Well, that's science, right? Like science, literally, we're not trying to prove anything with science. We're just saying, hey, this is the evidence that we have so far, and. We might or we we might even refute our own claims and hypotheses in future that's the yeah. beauty of uh 
Yeah, it's the beauty of science, I guess. <laughs> right. Which which we've done that. Like we thought the Earth was the center of the universe, right? And then we thought the sun was the center of the universe. And okay. then we thought Pluto was a planet. Yeah, you know, all these things with our increased knowledge. We debated quite a bit on that. Yeah, <laughs> we went back and forth on that for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, we have to unlearn the things that we thought we knew, which like some of the observations from the James Webb Space Telescopes are, are having us unlearn things that we thought we knew with now mm. new data where we're like, oh, well, new data means we have to change our, our beliefs and way of thinking because okay. now we have more data. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, in one of these articles, um, I, I forget who this uh, scientist was, but uh, she mentions that uh, in, in terms of life form, she says, uh, if there's something on Mars, it's likely to be very small, like bacteria, you know, and that's exactly what he said. And, uh, and she says that there is a better chance of having slightly higher forms of life on Europa, like uh, similar to the intelligence of an octopus. Uh, is this true? Like, is it a better? I see why that statement could be made. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Okay, so I have not heard this in like a in a valid sense. So there's a movie called okay. Europa Report that was released in like 2009, and it's humans going to Europa to investigate it, and then like they find life under the ice. And spoiler alert, it's like a giant octopus. Um, so th the reason, like, I think that may be said is because if we look at Mars. So Mars, the start of the solar system four and a half billion years ago, right? At some point, Mars lost its atmosphere because the molten core, like, frozen, knocked it off. Um, we think maybe something impacted Mars and, like, shut down the core, made it cool. The magnetic field went away that was protecting the atmosphere. And then the solar wind from the sun started stripping away the atmosphere, which is why Mars is now the desolate place it is today. So there's been a lot of evolutionary change on the surface mm -hmm. of Mars, right? It was full of water and had an atmosphere and then it went away. So it doesn't have the four and a half billion years of consistent um, environments, right? Now, like not even Earth has that, right? Like Earth has evolved and, and changed over that, but we have been at a equilibrium or at a, stable enough environment for enough years for us to develop where we are. So Europa, right. it's been around for about four and a half billion years, about the start of our solar system from what we can tell. And the life that we think is on Europa is going to be in the ocean or like underneath the surface. So that has been protected for, from, for, for our best knowledge right now, for the entirety of ex existence. Okay, that's probably a little bit harsh, but for a long time, so let's say two billion years, half of it existence, the ocean has been there and stable. So that gives much more time for a microorganism to develop to then possibly evolve into something else. Now, the question that I would push back in this situation would be, why would that microorganism need to evolve into an octopus mm -hmm. so we we don't know much about the geological history um you know underneath the surface of europa so we do know about the geological history of earth and how it's changed over years and how things needed to evolve to adapt to the environments so yes it's been around longer however we have no real idea of what the internal structure has been like since the beginning to to now we don't have core samples like we can take on earth and see the layers of rock of like what was going on in the core or differences that in ice like we have in antarctica that we could get at europa to see what in past millennia it's been like so theoretically i see the claim mm -hmm. scientifically i believe that that's just conjecture because we really have no idea if one, if biology works anywhere other than Earth, and uh, and mm. two, we don't know anything about the past of the interior structure at Europa yet. Mm. It, it could be a claim that maybe Europa has better conditions for evolution. That is only if you 
think in terms of evolutionary um, science. Like uh, if it yeah. could even stop with microbes, right? Like maybe microbes is the most advanced form of uh, living life on 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 Mars or other planet. Like we just don't know. Like we still don't know if humans are the most advanced. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be something else after this, uh, but yeah. Well, there's also the argument of humans aren't the most advanced species on the planet as well, mm -hmm. since, you know, we are self-destructive um, in our right. own rights. Like octopus could be smarter than us. They are incredibly. Dolphins, animated. right? Um, like yeah. dolphins. Mm -hmm. so, that's an we could have a whole conversation, like a whole yeah. podcast just on, on that just stuff. But that's out of my wheelhouse and area of <laughs> expertise. That's just fun conversation to have thought experiments no, about just just throwing in all the conjecture i mean yeah. we, we don't know we could we could be on to something here but yeah. uh what would be your best bet on uh mars or uh europa oh europa hands down i think mars is dead okay mm -hmm. <laughs> all right yeah um <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how that's i kind of like introduce some talks is i'm like all right what is the, the best place to look for aliens and people go like mars and i bring up a slide that's like mars with a skull and crossbows i'm like no Mars is dead. Mars is dead. Okay. Let's go out to Jupiter. Let's go to one of its moons, Europa. That has much higher potential. Yeah. Um, That's a hill I will die on. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to science communication from aliens. Uh, what made you give up your coveted day job at NASA to become a communicator? Wish there was a straightforward answer for that one. <laughs> so why did I quit? Yeah, my dream job to do what I do mm -hmm. now, to, like educate yeah. about science. And like, I guess basically a top level answer is like, I enjoy it more. Like I fell in love with science education. I fell in love with public outreach. I would rather be doing public outreach than my design job in the cubicle. And I was like, okay, like I got the job at nasa and then it wasn't exactly what i thought it was going to be like like once the halo mm -hmm. effect wore off and i'm like okay this is what i'm supposed to do for the next 40 years um mm -hmm. i don't know if i want to be doing this for 40 years like i'm a very extroverted person i like to be out and about and like always experiencing something new and like doing things that have never been done before is amazing they they take a lot of repetition and iteration to make happen and we talked about before government red tape and bureaucracy and it's not just altruistic science there's politics that come into play and management and like i worked for two years on the europa lander and then a cent or a congressman in texas didn't get reelected, so then that project died and it's like mm. things that are completely out of your control and i'm like i like to have more control of my life and such but yeah it was basically I fell in love with science education and I knew something in my life had to change. I knew that I wasn't meant to just like do what I'm doing right now for the rest of my life. And it took me a right. long time to figure out what that was going to be. Um, but it came to a point where I was able to generate income from teaching about science. And I'm like, well, if I can do this and pay my bills, I would rather do this all day long. Like, inspire and educate than do like what I dreamed about as a kid because now I'm an adult dreams change you learn more like you said with science you get new data I got new data now I'm in this environment now I, I change my beliefs I change I, I reevaluate where I am and where I want to go so I was it was it was tough right I'm like mm -hmm. like I, I spent 15 years working towards that dream people would kill for the job i have so right. many people ask me how they can get my job and i am consider considering leaving it to do something else to do something on my own and i had a lot of conversations with people with my boss who hired me at nasa with uh mm -hmm. with my significant other at the time my best friends my family parents thought I was going to be throwing away my education. <laughs> you know, so they, they, you know, you get that typical parent mindset, but it really came down to that. 
I feel so much more enjoyment and purpose in life when I'm on the front lines interacting with people to inspire them. I feel mm -hmm. like I had a unique set of skills. Thinking of Liam Neeson, you know, I think unique particular set of skills from that movie mm -hmm. that uh, I needed to, to use that gift the right way. And I was inspiring people working at NASA, just being an NASA employee, working on spacecrafts that will eventually mm -hmm. launch on a rocket, go out, and they will inspire millions of people. But I'm so far disconnected from that process. It's me and thousands of other people that made this thing come together, which is great. But now I am impacting hundreds of thousands. I think it's like oh, probably over a million at this point of people doing what I do personally. And that would never exist if I wasn't there. So like when I quit NASA, they replaced me. Someone else did my job. If I quit now, no one replaces what I do. And I just, mm -hmm. I find that so much more soul fulfilling and purpose driven than when I was, was at NASA. But I'll tell you, when I put in my my notice, when I went into my mm -hmm. boss's office and said, like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to do this, I cried every single day until the day I left. Like, I would close the door to my mm -hmm. cubicle and tears would be rolling down my cheeks. And I'm like, am I doing the right thing? Like, yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I have faith. I believe that I am. And, you know, throughout time, people were telling me, like, during this time, like, I was spreading the word um like my boss's assistant was like good i'm like what do you mean she's like oh you're you're meant to go on from here and do something else it's like i see it in you so like hearing those things really helped out i was really afraid to tell jim mcclure who runs the sfop the space flight operations facility at nasa jpl who uh the lucky peanuts guy if you've heard of the lucky peanuts story um, he runs yeah. the SFAF. I'll tell you about the Lucky Peanuts in a second. Um, mm -hmm. But I really looked up to him so much. And when I, he was like the last person I told. I was like, so I'm leaving. I'm going to here. And he just looked at me and he smiled. And he's like, good. He's like, you're going to go and do amazing things. He's like, just don't forget about us. I was like, mm -hmm. I thought you were going to be mad at me. Say like, don't leave. Yeah. Like disappointed. So it was great. And I went back last year. I've gone to JPL a few times and I was back last mm -hmm. year and uh, I didn't know if he'd remember me, but I walked into his office and he's like, I'm like, do you remember me? He's like, Oh my God. Yeah, of course. Like you're still, I have your photos still up on the wall. Like I'm seeing what you're doing. Like, it's amazing. He's like, you made the right decision. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so many things were valid. It's yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to, to make that decision in the first place, like if you would have told yeah. me, you know, right. Any time before I got my job that I was going to quit that job, I said, you're crazy. Why would I quit being a NASA rocket scientist? Like, yeah, you must be an alien because you don't know what the heck you're talking about. Yeah, that, the, the process, um, like, especially when, you know, you get your dream job and then, uh, like, what was the process? Like, you're, you're working on your dream job, but you feel like, oh, that is something else better. Like, maybe you've outgrown it or you, you're looking for a new challenge. But um, it's also a comfort zone, right? Like you're moving outside your comfort zone. Um, what was that that feeling like? Yeah. Chaos. But I have found that like I thrive in chaos when I'm under pressure mm -hmm. is when I do my best. I've lived my entire life outside of my comfort zone, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, entire life, let's say. Entire adult life, we'll say that. And mm -hmm. when I feel comfortable like when I'm starting to feel complacent or like comfortable, I'm like, Ooh, something's wrong. Like something's got to change. I don't know what that is, but something needs to change. And I did work for a company after NASA for a while. And while I was there, I was like, okay, like something needs to change. I can't leave this job right now, but like I go to the gym every day. I change gyms. I'm like, I need to change something. I need to get out of that comfort zone. So a lot of people, you know, freak out when they don't know what to do or the uncertainty of something like, yes, one of my greatest fears and possibly the greatest fear is the unknown, but it mm -hmm. also creates a fire inside of me like nothing else. Mm -hmm. Like I actually quit the job at NASA before I had an official offer from another place and 
I didn't have a problem with that because I'm like, I'll figure it out. And even like nowadays mm-hmm. or it's like a project falls through or like things get hard and I'm like, I'll figure it out. I'd rather mm-hmm. have this stress of I'm in control of everything rather than the stress of like letting someone else decide my fate or letting someone else choose what projects I'm going to work on, what my work schedule is. Like now I am an, an entrepreneur, I'm self-employed and I like control. <laughs> so mm. like mm. even like I like to control my ability to be uncomfortable. I want to put myself in an uncomfortable situation rather than having someone else or a different environment and an uncomfortable situation come upon me. So I'm choosing which uncomfortable situations to put myself in. Do you think this was because of um, like, because of space, because, you know, space is, uh, you're exploring the unknown. It's, it's very chicken and egg. It's this attitude because you've been working with space uh, research or like, you know, rocket engineering and stuff, or is it because of this attitude you think you chose that field? possibly i I mean Mm. okay i won't say possibly there's definitely an influence definitely subconsciously or directly if you had like a psychologist on the podcast maybe we can like put me in contact we can do a deep dive i might yeah i i I have a few friends who i've reached out to but yeah (laughs) we might have one (laughs) yeah that's a great inquiry one of the things Mm. that kind of is sticking in my brain now is that I worked in this building. It was called uh, three three hundred one was the number of the building, and it's where like TMX, that uh, rapid design environment, the concurrent engineers. That's where I first worked. This is before working on uh, Europa Lander. So I was in that environment, and when you walk in, right to the left, there is a wall. Of course, um, there's a wall, and mm-hmm. it's called the disruptor wall. And there are photos of people who are known as disruptors on this wall, and I looked at it every day and the the inspiration, the purpose of that wall was to inspire us to think outside the box, to do things that have never been done before, because that's what we are doing. So it was to serve as motivation, as role models for us to push forward the boundaries of space and technology and do these things, find the answers that they don't have answers to. So there's people up there like Lady Gaga, Oprah, David Bowie, Captain James Kirk, um, James, James Cook. Pele, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then technologies like additive manufacturing, Mars Cubes One, which is the first interplanetary CubeSat to autonomous driving cars. And I, I really resonated with that wall in like everyone up there didn't truly, I guess, like they didn't conform. They didn't mm-hmm. fit in. They had their own thing. I I don't want to call it a brand or a persona, but it's like they were unapologetically genuine to what they truly believed and wanted to do. And they were seen as disruptors because it went against the conventional way of thinking or progression of society at that moment where things were complacent. And then this this disruptor came up and disrupted the industry or the world. Like Steve Jobs is up on that wall, obviously with the iPhone and iTunes and everything that Apple has done in our our world. So seeing that day in day out was inspiring us to do unthinkable things, but I felt more in common with those individuals than I did with my peers at work, my colleagues. I felt Mm -hmm. like that wall was like calling to me or it's like, Kevin, come join us. Like Mm -hmm. you, you have these thoughts, like you want to do things that kind of have never been done before like talking about quitting nasa like who quits nasa to like yeah you know like maybe go on to like another company but i'm quitting nasa to like start something from myself and it's not like a space company it's like just to teach people about space and and things so i think because of that environment it gave me the the idea or the confidence or like the inception Mm -hmm. of the idea Mm to live like that or maybe like i think it maybe we're doing a real-time therapy session here this is great <laughs> <laughs> i didn't plan to this is um you know completely ad hoc yeah <laughs> yeah i i think 
now that now that we're talking through this, I think that like experience at NASA at JPL with the disruptor wall and stuff made me aware of this these tendencies. But before NASA, like I had a, a long term girlfriend in Wisconsin, and then I got an internship at NASA in Virginia. And without a second thought, I'm like, yeah, I'm moving. Like, okay, bye. Um, like we were still together, but I'm like, the, the importance here is this, like I'm getting out of my comfort mm -hmm. zone, I'm chasing my dreams. I moved to Illinois, didn't know a single person to do an internship. I moved to Virginia on last minute notice and left my family, friends, you know, a girlfriend that I thought I was going to be marrying and having kids with to pursue this. I moved to Atlanta for grad school, didn't know a soul. I moved to LA to work for JPL and I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm like, constantly putting myself out there and being at JPL, seeing that disruptor wall, I think is what made me aware to the fact of like, oh yeah, I have been like this. I totally can do that. Hmm. So interesting. That was a great inquiry. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, food for thought, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you, have, you have the rest of the the day and the long weekend to think about it. Uh, we should yeah. probably talk about it more. Um, <laughs> tell us about Space Class, your your baby Space Class. <laughs> yeah, Space Class. Here we go. I got a sticker. So Space Class. Let's bring it up a little bit more. Oh, oh yeah. Which there way? it is. This way. That way. Mm -hmm. Space yeah. Class. Virtual right. SpaceClass.com is an online suite of space lessons for kids. Now, this doesn't uh, adhere to standards or curriculum that's in schools. I am teaching about the things that you teach, that you learn at a space camp. So I taught mm -hmm. space camps around the country and around the world. I go to Turkey, not Turkey. I go to Turkey, but I teach the space camp in Korea every summer. And I wanted to give access to this information about space and exploration to everybody at any time. When, I, when I'm teaching in person, I can have... 10 to 30 kids in a room and like that's it and then i have to be there but if i can create an online course that anyone can access at any time then i can expand my reach it can be in any single country i don't have to travel there anyone can take this and learn the people who don't normally have access to this information all you need is an internet connection and we can make that happen so right mm -hmm. now space class is a suite of 10 online virtual lessons that is everything from rovers, submarines, rockets to more scientific things like geology, spectroscopy. Uh, we talk about astronauts and it is going to evolve into more. But right now it's those 10 classes at virtualspaceclass.com. It's $29.99. But if you sign up for the mm -hmm. newsletter, you get $10 off. So it's $19.99. It's 20 bucks. They get these lessons. And the big part I will say is that getting in now grandfathers you or grandmothers you into every single thing that's coming in the future so space class is evolving into source class which is going to have mm -hmm. a master class suite of all things stem so we're gonna have space class then we have ocean class air class wildlife conservation class insects class everything taught by the experts in the field so something mm -hmm. that we see a lot on youtube and everything is anyone with an internet connection can post content is it credible who knows um that's that's the question but with space class i'm the expert i speak about it and not only am i the expert i had all of the lessons personally reviewed by three or four individual experts at nasa or other top aerospace companies so we know that the content is credible and that's how it's going to be for every single course lesson and host that comes in to source class is you know the information is accurate it's geared towards kids it's interactive it's fun it keeps your attention engaged it's not like those boring lectures we used to like listen to or watch and right. at the end you know there's interactive quizzes so i call mm -hmm. it like it's like a master class for kids in all areas of stem but better mm -hmm. because master class isn't as engaging it's kind of like dry and more professional this is it's fun, engaging. I'm a big kid. Everyone's going to be able to like resonate on the, the the energy and and learn. Like learning is fun, and that's what space class does. 
Interesting. Like, I, I think this will be like great gifts, birthday gifts for uh, kids as well, like getting a subscription. And yeah, I was, I'm planning to get my nephew who's crazy about rockets and, and uh, yeah. airplanes and stuff. So he's only six. So I'm just going to wait for like a year. And then um, I'm planning to get him the subscription. Um, hopefully, uh, it'll be the end of the year. Um, but <laughs> uh, so you've spoken to more than a million individuals from you know, ranging from kindergartners to retirees. Um, I was wondering who has been your toughest audience so far? Who has been my toughest audience? It, oh, well, it changes based upon when you ask me. So mm. how, what, right what now, right the now? toughest. <laughs> It depends what I'm teaching. It depends what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, we had a conversation previously where we addressed this in a couple different ways. And I'm going to go a completely different way than what we addressed mm -hmm. before. Um, yeah. I would say probably the most difficult conversation or my toughest audience is, how do I phrase it? Like, Americans that are interested in space, um, which you might think is like the easiest conversation, right? Mm -hmm. The reason I'm going to bring that up is because there's a big push in the privatization of space that's saying like access to space, increasing access to space for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're seeing Jeff Bezos going up in Blue Origin's rocket and we're seeing uh, Richard Branson going up in Virgin Galactic's right. rocket. It's like, okay, yeah, we're bringing more people into space like it's starting with the billionaires and then we're moving on to like the the super rich and then the famous and eventually it'll come down to like your everyday person we saw the mm -hmm. same thing with like airplanes like first airplanes were just cargo all we did was you know send mail around the country and then we're like oh well we can put some passengers on here and then like passenger airplanes started to happen first it was rich and famous you know, or like elected officials it was like people high up and then eventually now I can jump on a plane and go anywhere in the world for a few hundred dollars, basically. Mm -hmm. So increasing access to all. But this is all with the mindset of like first world developed countries in mind. And right. when you say space access for all, you're talking about bringing people to space. I want you to change your entire thinking. When you say space access for all, access to information regarding space regarding science i was down mm -hmm. in the caribbean and south america last year in third world underdeveloped countries where kids never look through a telescope they mm -hmm. are interested in what is above them what is in outer space but don't even have an internet connection to explore to, to, to even google what is space right they don't have access to space class i wanted to give it to a classroom and they're like well we don't have internet so I had to like download the lessons and like give it to them on a, uh, I was gonna say floppy disk, on a, like a USB so they can put it in the computer and like they can watch it, but they never knew this existed. So you're saying space mm -hmm. access for all, I call bullshit. You're talking about bringing first world developed people into outer space. You do not actually have the desire for everyone in the world to have access just to the information about space. So, mm -hmm. It's the blind side and it's not, um, it's not deceptive. It's not like poor. This is an unknown unknown that, that these people have. They don't even think about it. It's complete ignorance where I didn't even think about this until I had the experience. So the toughest audience is being people who are excited about space and are thinking about it from their biased perspective. And I'm trying to get them like, okay, like let's, Think about this. Let me share you this story. It's like you're caring about trying to get people into outer space. What about this person that I've met? What about, you know, Jorge that likes the stars now is looked through a telescope for the first time, but has mm -hmm. no way to learn more about it except for this box of materials that we just gave him. All right. They're going through school, but they just don't have access to those sorts of things, which is a really hard mm -hmm. thing to do when you introduce somebody to an unknown unknown something they've never known before which they now need to try to accept that 
or change their way of thinking with this new information. So like you kind of like me going to NASA, right? I knew all about this. This like this was my path. And then I learned something new and needed to decide if I was going to change the course of my life or change my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So talking to people who have been like set in like this is the way, this is what I'm doing. And you give them a whole new area or path that they didn't right. know was possible or existed. They look at it, it hasn't been walked before. It's difficult. Everyone else is going this way. So to get them to leave that path and go this way, and that's that's tough. That's a tough audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you mean that uh, the American audience is more aware or maybe because of availability and um, uh, or just like they have more access when compared to, you know, other other countries? It's just they're also uh, unaware of what is common here. It, it could be completely uncommon in other places, other countries. Yeah. Yeah. Like I complain about the education system here in America. So many people do. But like the access to information that we have right. is insane and when we say we all the time we think of we as americans or maybe you'll think about it as we as in like the world but you're thinking about it as in developed countries right like mm -hmm. one of the things that you know starlink and OneWeb and these other constellation of satellites is to give global internet access because that now is something that we see as a basic right you know Right. Food, water, yeah. shelter, internet access. And mm -hmm. we don't have that everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that we take for granted that just the access of information, we don't think about it. It's like, what do you want to be when you grow up is something we get asked. Yeah. And we have all of these options down in like South America, where I was and, and other countries, you know, in, in Africa, Europe and Asia, you don't even know those options exist right yeah yeah and it's mm. it it changed my life being down there for sure <laughs> that's, that's i mean it, it humbles you in in a lot of ways actually yeah mm -hmm. um you know speaking of your books uh, um you know we've discussed a little bit about nasa to nasa and beyond but uh your second book to dare mighty things seem very different so yes, what or who is who was your muse for writing this one what or who for to dare mighty things yeah yeah is that basically the second book? say it again uh is is to dare mighty things your second book or was to nasa and beyond your second uh technically third so to nasa oh, and beyond okay. is technically my second book uh the first okay. one it's called the the quick guide to adulting, and it's all about the things that you don't te they don't teach us in high school that they should. Okay. How to do your taxes, okay. how to rent, like how to buy a right. home, all of those mm -hmm. things. And then the second book, like the full length book, would be To Nas mm -hmm. and Beyond. This was published in okay. 2019, and then To Dare Muddy Things was published almost exactly a year ago in 2023 in April. So To Dare Muddy Things, I basically wrote for me 10 years ago. It's a personal development self-help book, and mm -hmm. it goes through taking the design process that I was taught at NASA to build and design spaceships, and I analog that to achieving any goal or dream. It's the same five-step process. You have an idea, you believe it's possible, you figure out different ways to do it, you pick a way, and then you take action and do that way. And if that doesn't work, you go back to figure out what are different ways to do it, pick one, and go over and over again. It's the same five steps that we use for every space mission that I've ever been a part of. And I saw this while I was there and I was like, oh, that's holy moly. Cool. Um, this is a new way to approach things from a different perspective of kind of like the same information. I want to share this with with other people. And if I knew mm -hmm. about this 10 years ago, like my life would have been so much better to just understand the process of this is how you have to go about doing things to get things done. And then also I've paired that with something I call the Phoenix mentality, which I say I thrive in chaos. And that's because I've been beaten down so many times and been able to stand back up 
because of my personal development and improving my mental health and working on myself as a person. So I teach you the tips and tricks along the way to forge that Phoenix mentality, to go through this process, to literally build a, a dream life, something that is out of this world, whether that's you know getting a job at NASA, starting your own company, you know, becoming an artist, or just feeling a little bit better about yourself and like to feel confident and strong, like that's who this book is for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to be putting uh, links to all of that in the description. So, and it, this is available on Amazon, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Or um, okay. there's a special offer if you go to book dot to dare mighty things dot com the special mm -hmm. offer is always changing um you know sometimes you get a free kite which is says to dare mighty things or remove before flight mm -hmm. which is something big in our industry that's always on the rockets or the the planes so you get okay. the, one of these could be could be a free course could be a free coaching session could be mm -hmm. uh you also get copies of to nasa and beyond so I'm always changing up what the special offer could be, but if you go to mm -hmm. book.todaremightythings.com, you get that. Otherwise, yeah, it's all available on Amazon as well. Amazon, great. Um, tell us a little bit about your uh, American Ninja Warrior face. Uh, is that something for? Is it something that you picked up for discipline, or what was the story behind that? Yes, so I competed on American Ninja Warrior, the the TV show. And before that, I was a bodybuilder. So I was up on stage, I was posing, I was looking pretty, but I didn't wear the like bikini thing, I wore a swimsuit. So <laughs> just wanna preface that. Um, but I felt too much like an ornament that like I was for look and show and not for functionality. I wanted to use my body as a tool, get back to being an athlete like I was in high school playing sports. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for uh, Tough Mudder, which is an obstacle course race, three Spartan races, which are also obstacle course races, and then applied to the American Ninja Warrior TV show all in the same week. I'm like, I need to get back at this. Because um, people for a while say, oh, you should try that out. It's like, no, that's hard. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, and when I transitioned my training into American Ninja Warrior, like it was hard. It's, it's difficult. But what I really liked is that it was a combination of mental and physicalness. It was a mental challenge because you're failing all the time. Like you fall off an right. obstacle, you get up, you try it again. And then you also have to figure out how to do it. Just like climbing, climbing's a puzzle to figure out. You have to figure out the best route, the best ways. I can even use my you know, engineering mind to figure out what different angles and what's the best way that I can try to traverse this obstacle. So I got the call, I, I was able to get on the show. So I competed on season nine and 10 on 2017 and 2018. I did not make it all the way through. I did not hit a buzzer. I fell into the water and made a big splash both times. Okay. <laughs> but then after that, I transitioned into what's called a ninja tester. So for the last six or seven years now, I've been working with the show to test all of the new obstacles that you see every year before they're even made for the show, they're made out of like two by fours, plywood, maybe some duct tape. It's a little bit more advanced mm -hmm. than that. But before they polish it up for the show, there's a bunch of different variations. And me and some other ninjas are in a warehouse just playing on the uh, the adult jungle gym to see, you know, what works well, what doesn't work well. And it's, it's so much fun. Like the ninja community is kind of like the space community, wherein... Mm -hmm. I talked about like how mission, some missions don't go forward and we're like, oh, it's not my mission, but great, we're getting new science. The ninja right. community is like that too. It's like, oh, I didn't pass this obstacle, but I want you to get past it. Like the community and support of wanting others to achieve success despite wherever mm -hmm. you are. Like, oh, if you, if you pass this obstacle, yeah, I get kicked out because I haven't gotten this far, but I want you to do it. It's like the love and support of the community there is, mm -hmm. is amazing. And that's, that's something I fell in love with as well. Yeah, that's a mental, physical challenge with a, with a feeling of family. Mm. It's great. Yeah. Well, well, we've now come to the last segment. I call it the dig deep. It's kind of like, you know, rapid fire, five quick questions. Oh. Uh, there, are no wrong, there are no wrong answers. So uh, what are we, Pops? Um, <laughs> Taking all of the stress and pressure questions. away. Yeah, just no, no pressure, no pressure at okay. all. Okay, all right. Um, so what does space mean to you? Space means infinite possibilities 
and discovering new things about yourself and the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is your vision? What is my vision? My top level vision is to expose and educate as many people as possible about the wonders of space exploration and its importance, uh, importance to us here on Earth while also helping as many people as possible become the best version of themselves for their own satisfaction and for the other people in their life. Beautiful. What does failure mean to you? Failure to me means choosing to stop doing something rather than exhausting additional mm -hmm. possibilities to make it happen. To explain mm -hmm. a little bit further, I don't believe failure is a thing. I believe mm -hmm. that we choose to stop fighting for something. So there is no failure. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I've chosen to stop fighting for this particular thing. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you've given your best and uh, you choose to, you choose to choose something else. Okay. That's, that's yeah. nice. Like if you didn't get a job, um, you can go to another job, get experience, and then reapply to that job. If I didn't get the NASA mm -hmm. job, I could have gone to Boeing or somewhere else, get experience, then transfer mm -hmm. over into NASA. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you're choosing to give up. I chose to give up NASA. I chose to give up bodybuilding. I chose to give up uh, an apparel company. I chose to give up trying to pitch this TV show. So the things mm -hmm. aren't failures. It's just you're yeah. choosing to stop putting effort in continuing to pursue an opportunity that you now deemed not appropriate for you anymore. Hmm. Now that's, that's beautiful. Um, what keeps you going? Oh, what keeps me going? The two things that come into mind for rapid response would be just this innate fire within me to weave all of my potential here on earth my biggest regret would be being on my deathbed and not having and like i guess being on my deathbed and meeting the best possible version of myself and it's not me mm. so i keep on going so i don't have that the other one is anytime anyone shares with me something positive like two days ago someone tagged me on something on linkedin and said like you're one of my inspirations for wanting to go into space. Anytime I see something like that, it just all comes mm -hmm. back. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, it used to be, I'm just trying to impact one person. And there's been so many one persons that I'm like, okay, it's good. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. doing it. It, it, yeah. it works. Yeah. The, the last one, curiosity or passion. What's your pick? Curiosity. Okay. Because if you're curious passion will follow yeah that's i guess this was a it was a pleasure having you on the pod kevin um i'm gonna link all the descriptions of your ted talks your books and like the space class in the description below and great you know, people who are interested can get in touch with kevin um yeah that's it from us and uh Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, you know, being a part of this and being a sport once again to talk to me. Um, I had great fun and I'm sure uh, my audience is going to enjoy this as well. So thanks for your time. You're welcome. I appreciate it. This was a, a fantastic conversation. I love the, the real time therapy and also the, <laughs> the, like the, the deep inquiries. Like you've asked some questions that I've never been asked before, which is a very... Mm -hmm very enjoyable for me instead of you know getting up and like saying the same old things over and over again yeah. this was this is a great great experience so thank you for for okay. inviting me on. appreciate um, it um i'm i'm happy that that you know uh i didn't think i would uh make this make a rocket science uh scientist <laughs> think so much but i'm glad i did <laughs> good to see you good job <laughs> yeah thank you yeah